Excellent. Hi, everyone. Uh, Chris Walker. I work with Mercy Corps, which is an international nonprofit that does both humanitarian and long-term development work. Um, I have the very good fortune today of coming right after Neil and Kruskaya, who've done a great job of laying the broad framework for what I wanted to focus on in my discussion today, which is impact investing. Um, as Neil mentioned, a lot of the motivation for the focus on impact investing has come from this gap in financing to achieve the sustainable development goals. Um, this gap of two and a half trillion has really led to a lot of innovation and in how we can attract private capital into some of these development problems. Um, in, broadly, it's led to a field called innovative finance. Uh, a lot of definitions for what innovative finance is. The, the definition that I like the most is that innovate, innovative finance approaches are about mobilizing new capital or improving the effectiveness or efficiency of existing capital to solve problems. The challenge has been that a lot of the innovative financing approaches that are out there have been very niche or bespoke. They're addressing one very particular problem very creatively, but they've, the challenge has been either replicating or scaling those approaches. So within this broad umbrella of innovative finance, we can talk about any number of initiatives that are creative, but there are only a couple that have demonstrated signs of being able to scale in, in actually making an appreciable impact on this financing gap. Um, one of those areas is blended finance. Another one is impact investing. Um, the definition of impact investing is, is it's distinct from ESG investing, negative screening, responsible investing, in that it's investing across asset classes with the intentionality of having a positive social or environmental impact that you can measure. Um, in the, what we focus on largely at Mercy Corps is a segment of that impact investing area. It's providing equity to startup ventures, to, to, pri to uh, rather than debt, just equity, and not doing project financing, but rather investing in businesses. That's one piece of it, but impact investors are investing across multiple asset classes um, and in investing both in the developed world as well as in emerging markets. Now, I, I looked back, um, the, this idea of impact investing, of having investing for intentionality, for, for positive social environmental impact, really has been around with uh, that definition for about a decade. Um, so back in 2010, JP Morgan put out a, a report about impact investing and making the argument that it's an emerging asset class. And at the time, I think the estimate was about $4 billion that year going into impact investing. Uh, JP Morgan, in its study, made the projection that over the next decade, so up through 2020, where we are today, that about a range of $400 billion to $1 trillion would flow into impact investments. So we don't have data yet for where we're going to be at the end of 2020. The most recent data comes out of the Global Impact Investing Network. They do an annual survey. Their survey came out last year, middle of the year, but really on data through the end of 2018. And at that time, about $240 billion was under management, broadly defined for impact investing. You can look at the methodology and make some arguments around it. It probably is a bit underrepresenting the total amount. So JP Morgan wasn't too far off in its projection about a decade ago. So we're seeing impact investing beginning to scale. But there are still a lot of challenges around impact investments, and there are a lot of gaps there. Um, Neil described one of them, which is where are there enough investable deals? There's a lot of big capital sitting out there in institutions that want to put money into these deals, but they're not finding enough that are at that level of scale. So there's a gap in the early stage. Um, this gap has been around for quite some time. It's in part led to a, a real growth in business incubators and accelerators in emerging markets to deal with the fact that there are a lot of really interesting social enterprises trying to get underway, but they struggle to get the capital that they need to begin to grow to a size where big institutions would take a look at them. Um, big institutions are there. I think of the world's 10 largest asset managers, nine of them now have impact investing units. That's driven by consumer demand. Their customers are asking for ways in which they can invest their money for impact. But again, they're struggling to find enough deals there. So 
imagine a, a startup social entrepreneur in a fragile market, an emerging market, um, going to the topic of this conference. Capital markets are not very deep. Um, if you're a startup entrepreneur in Silicon Valley in the US, you have any number of angel investors to go to, you have friends and family, you have credit cards. You can find ways to finance uh, your idea. And then eventually you can start tapping into the very vibrant and robust venture capital community uh, out on the West Coast or broadly within the US or, or in Europe. Um, those sorts of markets are very nascent in many fragile and emerging states. So as an early stage entrepreneur, you, even if you can access now an incubation program, an acceleration program, you still struggle to get the capital that you need to get to say $5 million investment round, $10 million investment round where other investors get interested in you. And so that's the long story of why is Mercy Corps a nonprofit doing impact investing? Well, it's really to start to address this pioneer gap at a really early stage. And we're not alone, by the way. Other NGOs are getting into this game as well for various motivations. But I would say largely it's as we look out at the problems that we're trying to address through traditional development projects that are funded by grants, we often work with governments, we work with civil society organizations, we work with other nonprofits, but entrepreneurs are a key part of solving big problems. Many entrepreneurs come from the communities, they understand these problems intimately, they are innovating aggressively to find solutions and they need support. And NGOs, non-governmental organizations, are often very well positioned to provide that kind of support. They understand the risks of those markets, they have the ability to blend capital, access to grant money, um, as well as other types of capital to provide support to those entrepreneurs. A lot of local market knowledge, a lot of uh, local connections, and I would argue often a better understanding of the risk um, because of that local presence. So what, what we have done to try to fill this gap um, that exists is to provide equity, anywhere from $50,000 to $250,000 to really early stage enterprises, co-investing with others, there aren't too many, but with other entities, to help accelerate the growth of these entrepreneurs. Many of them need not just capital, they need other types of support. So after we invest, we are also trying to leverage the networks that Mercy Corps has, our presence on the ground, our technical expertise, to help these entrepreneurs grow to the point that they can start accessing capital from, um, I would say, more commercially oriented impact investment firms. Uh, and so that's an area where, we, where we've really been trying to innovate. Let me just give you a little bit more detail for why that gap exists. Um, if you think about the structure of a normal private equity fund, um, there are many aspects of it that make it very challenging to invest at such an early stage. Number one, most of these funds are set up for a 10-year period, and they, they have to return after 10 to 12 years the capital to their investors. They generally have five years to find and make investments, another five years to harvest, to monitor, and then exit those investments. If you think about investing in a very early stage business in a risky emerging market, your capital needs to be a lot more patient often than that. And it's hard to find deals that you can do at an early stage that will yield a return to investors within that time period. Private equity funds have a very sim common structure. Uh, the, in the intermediaries are able to charge a 2% management fee on the capital under management and get carried interest at the end of the day. That management fee is not enough to cover a bunch of really small deals. If there's a fixed cost to doing an investment, whether it's a $200,000 investment, a $2 million investment, a $20 million investment. Your management fee is gonna go a lot further if you make a smaller number of large investments than a large number of small investments. So it also means that not a lot of private equity investors are looking for the small, early, risky deals. Um, the way we've gotten around that is rather than having a 10-year structure, we have a, something called an evergreen fund. We've raised philanthropic money. We've gone out to donors to Mercy Corps and said, look, you know, continue to donate for our traditional work, but why don't you donate and let us invest it as equity? If we get a financial exit, we'll reinvest that money over time because we don't have to return that money to grant makers. It's a grant to us. We can be much more patient. We also have subsidies built in so we can incur the additional cost and risk of making these really early stage investments. And so through this, we started to focus on social entrepreneurs that are benefiting fragile communities. I would say we still struggle from the same constraints that other investors would in terms of investing into a fragile state or fragile country in that 
we co-invest. We don't follow on our investments. We need other investors who are willing to come in alongside of us or after us, and you just don't see that a lot in fragile states. However, we're seeing a lot of entrepreneurs who are building businesses that are tech-enabled, that are scalable across countries and regions, where the products and services that they are selling can benefit fragile communities. And you can invest in businesses that are domiciled in a more stable country, but that are willing to expand their markets into more fragile areas and benefit those communities. We're, we also care quite a lot as a humanitarian organization about refugees and displaced populations. And there are a lot of entrepreneurs that are now focused on addressing some of the social needs of those sorts of fragile populations. So we've looked at investing in them. And let me give you just a couple of examples before I close. One of the countries in which we invest is Colombia. Mercy Corps has been working for quite some time there with vulnerable communities, especially smallholder farmers who live in conflict-affected regions of the country and could be a source of future instability. Uh, we have looked at and invested in a variety of enterprises that start to address the multiple needs of those smallholder farmers. So for instance, secure land title. We've invested in a private company that's a one-stop shop for a small landholder to come to and go through the entire process of getting legal title. We've invested in a logistics company that provides low-cost transport for the crops that these farmers are producing to get them from farm to market at a much lower cost. Logistics often accounts for a big part of the cost of getting produce to market. Uh, we've invested in a coffee company that's doing ethical sourcing of coffee, shipping it directly to the US, but doing more value added on site. So roasting the coffee on site and paying, not just paying farmers a higher price, but also employing female farmers to do the roasting so they get another source of income and then selling directly into the US market and soon to be the European market. So you start to see a cluster of investments that can all address some of the crucial needs of these vulnerable communities. We're also seeing entrepreneurs who have solutions uh, that directly address the needs of refugees. And they also need capital to scale, so by providing that capital and other support, we can start to see them go to some level of scale. So we've invested in a company that's providing very low-cost remittances so that Venezuelan refugees in Colombia can remit back into Venezuela at a much lower cost. Um, we've invested in a tech company that's using artificial intelligence to better match low-income um, wage earners to better jobs. They are very excited about moving into the Colombian market to work with Venezuelan migrants to help them get better jobs in hospitality and retail, et cetera. Um, it, one last source of fragility that we're focused on is climate change. Climate has changed already. A lot of smallholder farmers, especially in Africa, are at the front lines of that in dealing with the consequences right now. We've invested in a micro-insurance company that's private, providing insurance to those farmers against droughts that are increasingly frequent. Um, they are using a lot of technology, remote sensing from satellites, um, data from the ground, to, to uh, figure out what the risk is and to provide insurance, but not by selling insurance policies directly to small farmers, which is a really difficult proposition, but rather embedding that insurance into the seeds, the fertilizers, the other inputs that farmers are purchasing such that when a harvest fails because rains didn't materialize to allow the seeds to germinate, farmers get a free bag of seeds to replace that one and can save their harvest. So there are a lot of really interesting entrepreneurial solutions out there that are getting at the needs of fragile communities. Again, the trick is finding ways to invest in them at a very early stage and providing other support to them so that the bigger pools of capital can come in and really take these ventures to scale. So I'm happy to address some of those questions about how we can do that uh, during the discussion. Thank you.